you tend to worry a lot and you ask yourself, well, what are you worrying about? Well, you worry about things, you know, that the things that you worry about, most cases, you have no control over, you know. Um, people worry about politics and this and that and what's happening. And like, well, the only thing you have control over is your reaction, right? How you react and how you control your emotions, how you control yourself. From Caribbean Ideas Synapse in Trinidad and Tobago, this is Uptick, a podcast that's part of the Snapshot Podcast Network. Uptick is a show that brings you the stories of the Caribbean entrepreneurs and innovators who are building the next generation of great companies. These are the stories you don't typically hear of how these leaders are working to build brands and businesses that have the potential to not only improve the Caribbean world, but also help the Caribbean world make an impact on the global business stage. Their stories will move you, inspire you, push you to take action, or maybe help spark your next great idea. I'm your host, Chike Farrell, and in today's show, you learn what's possible when you mix an entrepreneurial itch with a determination to innovate by continually challenging the status quo as Monty Pemberton has. You'll also learn how leaders can encourage a culture of innovation and problem solving in their own organizations, plus some of the core traits you need to be successful as an entrepreneur or innovator. Finally, you'll hear why it's so important to set goals for not just your business success, but also your mental and physical health as you tackle the entrepreneurial journey. So I went to St. Mary's College and I actually wanted to do economics and I applied to universities locally and internationally. Um, but then at the end of law six, I changed to, I wanted to do accounting. So I went to my dad, I said, dad, I changed. And he said, well, great. He said, um, he will hook me up with a job, right? Uh, so I said, what do you mean? Am I not going to go to university? He said, the best way to actually become an accountant is actually to um, start as an intern. Um, so he called his friend at Winston Young, Philip Marshall. And a week after A-levels, I was actually working at Winston Young. Surprise to me, that wasn't part of the plan. But it certainly gave me a grounds up approach to understand accounting. Um, so I started doing my ACCA then. And then I moved to London and I finished ACCA up in the UK. Came back to Trinidad. And when I moved back to Trinidad um, after finishing studying, um, BP took over Amoco in 1999. And Ernst Young became the auditor. But Ernst Young had no energy experience at the time in Trinidad. And I just came back in and I was, I didn't have a portfolio, so I was placed in that account. So that put me straight in the heart of the energy industry in 1999. Um, and there's been no turning back since. And then I was approached by a very small oil company in Trinidad, um, pretty much a startup. They were buying over some assets in Trinidad. And I became the CFO of that company in 2005. Um, and that was called 10 Degrees North. I then became the CEO in 2008. I renamed the company Trinity, uh, changed the colors to red, white, and black. Um, 2008 was a very tough year because oil prices crashed. In June, it was $150 a barrel. And by December, it was $30 a barrel. We were able to survive. It's a much smaller scale, but I was the first, how best to put it, first real challenge of you know taking over the head of a company in the middle of oil crisis. Um, so we survived, and then we grew the company fourfold. Um, we did mergers, did one big merger, a couple of acquisitions, and then we decided because we had a very big private equity investor out of the US called Dunham Capital, we decided to take the company public on the London Stock Exchange. Um, so we successfully listed on the, um, the AIM Stock Exchange in London um, in 2013. Um, in doing that, which it was the first time ever in the history of Trinidad and Tobago that a Trinidadian company listed on the London Stock Exchange. Um, so Sajikor did it, but they were Barbadian, yeah, or Bajan. Um, so the first time, no other company ever did that. So it was great. We raised 90 million US in 2013. Um, and we did a very complex transaction. Um, it's called a reverse takeover. Um, essentially, we bought over another oil and gas company, which had assets in Trinidad. So it was a M&A plus going public, essentially. Um, but as soon as we did that, we got into some problems operationally, um, and then the oil prices crashed. Um, and that was a real, real learning lesson for me. Um, having just listed, it was you're happy, and it, it again plunged into uh, a macro, uh, an event that it, it, we didn't see, uh, or I did not see. Um, I took full responsibility for it. And one of the big learnings from that was 
You can look at everything internally impacting your business, but the macro side is what could come and haunt you overnight. And that's what businesses are seeing now in regards to COVID, um, the, the, the change in the whole energy markets, where in January of this year, no one predicted you know, what would happen. Yeah, so I was in, Ash- I was in Edinburgh, Scotland, and we had a board meeting there for the Trinity company I was CEO of. And after that board meeting, I reflected and I decided, you know, it's time for me to leave. And I wanted to start a, a private company to really pursue um, what I was doing before. So I went back to the hotel room and uh, started to look at, you know, well, what do I really want to do? And, you know, I wanted to take the learnings that, you know, we, we as a team learned prior to, well, before, refresh it and renew it to create an organization that was prepared for the future. Um, so that we could capitalize on that going forward. And that's how the name De Novo came about, because De Novo is Latin for a new or refresh. Um, and it's sort of built into our DNA that, you know, it's, it's, it's we're constantly refreshing, um, learning, unlearning to go forward. And one of the pillars that we used was, you know, we got to be technology-based. Um, a lot of companies in the Caribbean or in Trinidad, they talk technology, but they're not really anchored in technology at a boardroom level. Um, but we wanted that to be at the highest level within the organization. So we recruited a very young, fairly young CIO, a deputy CIO in Guardian Holdings, as, as you all know, is one of the largest or the largest insurance conglomerate in, in the Caribbean, um, to, to bring him into the energy industry, which he knew nothing about. Uh, but what we wanted is that fresh look. And he came into that fresh look, and we had a, some consultants out of Canada to guide us through that journey. And one of the important things that we learned is that it's a journey and it will always be a journey where you never reach that end position, but you're going along that path um, with a clear vision. Um, so that started off in 2016 and we, the journey is, has been really enjoyable. Um, if you asked me back then, um, would I be where, would the organization be where we are now from a technological perspective? I would say, no, you know, what are you smoking? Because we would not have envisaged that. But through that journey, our eyes opened up um, into new possibilities, uh, challenging, you know, our, our, how best to put it, our biases, our old way of doing things. Um, a classic example was, you know, we, when we raised the money, we raised 275 million US. You know, part of the budget was to set up the office, which everyone, you know, that's normal, right? And we said, okay, no problem. You have to buy servers, you have to buy phones, you have to buy laptops, um, you know, you have to uh, cable up your office, all these things. And then we asked the question, why? We realized we don't need it. So we went to a cloud-based function, a cloud, cloud-based solution. Um, so you did not need servers. That reduced a significant element of our cost because the cloud-based solutions are subscriber-based fee. Um, there's an upfront fee with regards to setting it up, um, the software tools and so on. But once you go ahead, it's a, it's a subscri- subscription-based fee. Um, so we save a lot of money up front, which is really good for your capital structure. Um, and it changes the thinking of the whole organization. So as an example, in, when we really brought in our CIO, we challenged everything, our old way of thinking of setting up um, operations and realized you don't need phones on your desk. You know, a, small, a, a phone on your desk costs about 1500 to 2000 TT dollars. You know, multiply that by 40 staff. Um, we did not need servers because we're using cloud. And, you know, by challenging everything, we're able to drop our costs significantly and move more to technology and user-based fee-type arrangements um, over time, which really changed our cost structure significantly. Because um, as a startup, you want to limit your upfront cost and try to push those costs later on when you do have some form of revenue. Um, so... So where we are now is we're fully digitized. You know, we are fully paperless. Um, our photocopy is in a back container in the office. And it's not even our office, actually, our main office. Um, and it is really a remarkable, um, has been a remarkable journey. And, and the, the, the Denova team, um, hashtag Denovians, we really look forward to see, you know, what we could accomplish uh, going forward uh, based on, on what we have learned so far. Um, and the new technology that's coming out and how it can be deployed in our organization to become even more efficient. Wow, that's great. And I, li- I like that, Denovians. I like that. That's great. Because actually, that you, you said a bunch of things there that I thought were really interesting. So we're going to dig into a couple of them. But actually, I'll start with the most recent one, right? Which is 
you know, I think anybody who's building anything or leading anything, right, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, you're running a team, running a department, you know, that that aspect of culture and and building a mindset and a way of approaching things is important. And, you know, based on what you just described, it would be, you know, essentially impossible to do that if you couldn't build a culture of, as you said, you know, challenging everything and asking the question why and, you know, and 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 continuous learning. So so how have you managed to reinforce that? I think I could interpret that part of it is by finding people who map to that, of course. But but tell me a little bit more about how you how you make that a, a, a way of doing things that's consistent across a large number of people. One of the things um, is really to build a diverse, for me, for us, was building a diversified, a diverse team of thinkers, which is an extreme challenge um, to manage. But in that diversity, it brings a huge strength. Um, once you have mutual respect amongst each other. Now, it was a, it, it was a huge challenge, lots of fighting. Um, don't get me wrong, it was a huge challenge, lots of fighting, shouting, um, words that should not be used. Um, but through that, um, with everyone focused on one common goal um, and putting their egos aside, the fights and the arguing and the challenging yielded a better result versus someone stating, I will do it, we'll do it this way, and you know, we're going to go forth on, on this basis. Um, because the power of the team came forward through those fights and through those arguments and the, the long nights and so on. That diversity you know, stood up pretty well. And that is one of our, that was one of our critical success factors within the team. Um, that ability to challenge each other at any level, you know, so it's 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 take off the gloves, you know, from the janitor to the CEO, doesn't matter, you know, uh, positively challenge um, and be willing to be challenged um, to make quick decisions based on that challenge. So our view is once you had subject matter experts in the room, and we had subject matter experts for each area, and we all challenged once you leave. More than likely, you have the right decision, the 8 to 20 rule. Um, and you can always tweak the other 20% as you move along. Um, and that allowed, us, that allowed us to move quickly, um, not compromising on quality as well. Uh, and that's the culture that we, we built. Um, but it was tough because a lot of the folks came from different backgrounds, different age groups, um, uh, different cultures as well. Um, so because we, 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 the, the, the platform was designed in, in Norwich, England. The gas processing facility was designed in Milan, right? Um, the platform was fabricated or constructed in Louisiana, Homa, um, in, in Homa, Louisiana, um, different culture, and everything was controlled out of Trinidad. Um, plus, we also had our subsurface team in Aberdeen, so, um, and, but control out of Trinidad, so multiple cultures were involved. So it's, it was difficult, but it, it's the common goal. We never lost sight of that. Um, and the fight to all is to get to the best result. And, and that diversity was, you know, where we were able to achieve what we did. So, so how do you, so, so, so tell me then, you know, how do you go about sharing, setting and reinforcing that, that common goal, as you've mentioned, because, because without that, to your point, you know, it, it, it's really difficult to bring people back toward, uh, you know, that, that central mission. So, so how are you as a leader and your leadership team making sure that people understand it, internalize it, and, and, and can really start living it? First, we simplified what that common objective is. Um, and as simple as that may sound, that took some time, right? Because, you know, a lot of people don't want to talk, don't necessarily want to disclose what exactly is your objective, Right. Is it to build a coffee shop? Is it to sell chocolate? So, you know, or is it to not build a coffee shop, but build a, an environment where people could come and explore learnings and drink coffee, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's really being absolutely clear on what the objective is and then having laser light focus on that one objective. And then through the recruitment process over time, ensure that everyone is aligned and constantly have alignment discussions around that objective. So that's, that's what we did, kind of simplify what that objective was uh, as much as possible and always come back to, you know, how, what, what we're doing, what you're saying, how does, that, how does that achieve our common objective? Hmm. So one of the themes of this first season of Uptick, I would say, has been, 
you know, continuous learning, test and learn, you know, it's called by different names, but, but it's sort of grounded in that, that, that willingness to, you know, try something, move, implement, adapt, come again. Um, and, and, and you kind of touched on it there. And I, and I've seen you talk about that in other interviews, kind of building a, an environment of continuous learning. But, but one of the things that stands out is you're like, wow, this is the energy industry, right? This is, you know, long lead time, big investment, um, not necessarily, you know, uh, the easiest scenario to, to switch on a dime and do things suddenly differently. So, so how does that manifest for you in a business and a sector like yours? We have biases um, that we come in life with and over time through our working environment, you know, and it's, it's we're accustomed to doing it this way. So one of the key things is to unlearn what we've learned, right? Um, and that was a common theme in our organization that when everyone came in, it's like you came with technical knowledge, right? Raw technical knowledge, whatever that technical knowledge is. But let's unlearn what you've learned and how that is applied, all right? And let's find a better way in this application that's far more agile, all right? Cost effective with the use of technology. So that, that was one key theme. And it took a lot of people, a lot of folks, um, a lot of time to get around to that. And what I mean, you know, we brought in folks from Fairly from, from formerly from the BPs and the shells. And, you know, they had a view of, you know, if you're running a project, it must work like this. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've, I've seen you. And, and we're like, no, we, we brought you in for your technical knowledge, right? What, what if there is a better way, right? And what if as a team, we find that better way and we cut the time down by half and, you know, we reduce the cost, you know? Um, and as they got into it and they realized and they saw it, then they believed it. But it's only coming down, you know, it, it, it needed constant reinforcing. And that's where the fighting was and the heavy discussions and the arguments. Um, it was folks trying to do it their way versus coming to a common way. And quite frankly, that, that takes time. That does not happen overnight. Um, that takes time. It requires everyone to trust each other um, and to get to know each other. Those soft points are, were equally important for us. And as time moved along, people began to see the benefits of that approach. Um, that's what we saw in the logo. Got you. And then, you know, I want to kind of go backward a little bit because, you know, you talked a little bit about some of your journey to to de novo and you know your career started off in in accounting and you know kind of getting a very practical exposure to um accounting and finance i'm always curious um you know in your case you had this sort of very clear you're in accounting then you're in accounting for for energy and then you you know kind of jumped from there but what are the things that you would say you know in your in your work before becoming an entrepreneur you know, what are the things that you'd say, hey, you know what, my, my, my earlier part of my career prepped me for what I am doing now. Um, and what are the areas that you would say, you know, no, there was no there was no relation between the things that I had learned and the things that I had to learn. What, was, what are some of those different, different things? Yeah, um, really good question. First and foremost is I would not have been here without really good mentors throughout my work life. Um, and whilst I was an accountant with Ernst & Young, I had some instrumental mentors who taught me how to manage, how to lead, how to take risk, manage risk. Um, so not, not about debits and credits. Um, and that was very powerful and, and who allowed me to be me, quite frankly. Um, so that was one key, key factor for us and for, for me, sorry. And I also went searching for mentors, meaning if I saw someone that, you know, um, and uh, that I, I wouldn't say liked, that I respected, I would engage them in the conversations, you know, what do you do? Why do you do it? How do you do it? You know, why did you do what you did? Um, explain to me the rational. Um, so I could just learn from them and understand the why and how. Um, so through, and I, was, I also had formal mentors as well when I was in England, um, where Ernst & Young had formal mentorship programs, which, you know, they sent, me, they sent us to various schools and that played a very big role in it. So, so that soft point is really important. Um, it was not about just going to work at Ernst Young, working and going back home. It was actually spending time with the partners um, in, in the audit firm. The in, sorry, in our clients, I also was mentored by clients as well. Just actively seeking mentors and and working with them. Um, I guess the 
The second one was the willingness to take risk or calculated risk and not being afraid of making a mistake. Uh, typically, in a, I guess the Caribbean, most I could speak for Trinidad and Tobago, but uh, probably the Caribbean, we, we tend not to be risk takers and be very conservative. And I'll give you an example. My, my, my father was the CEO of a small bank in Trinidad. And when I told him I was leaving Winston Young to join a small firm um, in Deep South that he never knew about, um, he told me I was absolutely mad. You know, um, why are you leaving a good job? You know, it's safe. You know, it's pensionable. You know, um, you could stay there for life. And I said, that's not what I want to do. You know, um, and sometimes in life, you have to make that risk, take that jump, that leap of faith. Um, and then I was also guided by uh, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, Steve Jobs wrote a, a very interesting um, article that's called Connecting the Dots. And it says sometimes in life you make decisions and you only understand it when you look back and see how the dots are connected. So, you know, if you didn't do this, then this would not have happened. You would not have met this person. This would not have happened, et cetera. And sometimes that leap of faith, understanding your gut takes you on a journey, which if you're prepared for the journey, will get you to where you want to go um, with many twists and turns. Um, but mentorships help, mentors help you avoid the big pit, pitfalls. So that was one of the key things for me. Um, Absolutely. No, that's, that, that, that's super powerful. And yeah, it's funny because, you know, how is... I'm interested in in the ideas of how you know our culture um, either encourages or maybe more accurately holds us back from you know being entrepreneurs and being innovators and so on. And you kind of touched on it, right? Which is this this sense of um, and you know that's a, that's a generational thing in in any culture, but it is sort of especially prevalent in Caribbean culture. I find you know I, I laughed as you talked about. Um, you know, family members or father of a different generation feeling like they're much more conservative. So how, how do you think that we could, in our culture, in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean at large, what are the things that we need to teach younger people that maybe you don't get in school um, that would help prepare you for a, a life as a leader or as an entrepreneur or an innovator? Um, whew, that's a good question. Um, I think. I hate to say this, but I think we need to go back to the old time days a bit, um, not in terms of lack of technology and so on, but a lot of the leadership skills that I learned, you know, came from being in scouts for seven plus Cub Scouts for what, at least 10 years. Um, and I'll give you an example. We talk about it all the time. You know, would anyone in this day and age, you know, send their, I was what, 12, 12 years old, send their 12 year old kid on a boat with 40 teenagers and one priest to stay down the islands um, in a house for a week with no contact. Um, you don't know what food they have. Four pirogs on the open sea with one engine. Um, you drop them off on a Sunday and you pick them up on a Saturday and you hear nothing. Um, not That's not happening in this day and age. But we were able to experience that. And by virtue of that, you were forced to work within a team, survive, um, eat or starve, um, cook, um, you know, and, and work with your team members or work with the other cup back members and scout, scout members to, 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 to live um, in, a, in a nice way. And those are the small things that are very, very important. Um, you know, we're, we're overly protective of our young, rightfully so. Um, but sometimes, you know, those leadership skills, I think, are also um, nurtured uh, at, at young ages so that they learn how to stand up on their own, make decisions, face consequences for your decisions. Uh, for your decisions. Um, so that's one important thing. I think we need to focus on the education system and ensure that our education system creates or have programs that help kids become leaders by being one, allowing them to make decisions on their own, being held accountable for those decisions. So however small for a 12 year old or 13 year old, you know, and at St. Mary's and Scouts down the island who are making decisions. And quite frankly, some of them life or death. Um, um, but you're facing consequences, and through that mechanism, you start learning very early. So that's one thing I like to see happen. And if you don't have any schooling system, you know, there are other mechanisms probably you could use. Yeah. So that's what I will focus on. Uh, one of the things I'll focus on. Yeah, that's 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 powerful, and it's funny because um, you know, with my Caribbean hat on, I have kind of the agency side, but then with my my US hat on, I um, 
you know, work and kind of run a run a global marketing team. And I have a person in in Amsterdam, and you 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 reminded me of what I thought was a pretty funny tradition that that I learned about that they that they have, uh, which is a Dutch scouting tradition called dropping, right. in which a group of children who are you know, who are young, you know, preteen, you know, you like literally apparently they drop them in the forest and say, okay, cool, find your way back to base. Um, and it's funny because the parallel, and I actually think that is almost like a scout related type scenario where, you know, it's, it's really about that sort of learning by doing, learning in, in practical ways. And, you know, and of course, sometimes you can approximate it in scenarios, but in other cases, you just need real world experience to be able to, 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 to learn and, and draw that lesson. So I think that's a really powerful example that you, um, that you gave as to, as to what we could do differently, right? I want to kind of go uh, then a little bit um, into a, an important part of the journey. So, so you were, before De Novo, you were at Trinity. So, so help me understand. So De Novo is clearly an entrepreneurial venture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but was so a Trinity was that also entrepreneurial or was that more you were recruited? So you were more, you know, a, a, an executive and a leader, yes. but it wasn't yours. Is that is that the distinction that, that we yeah. should understand? Yes, yeah, so I was recruited, CFO became the CEO um, and grew the company. So I was more of an executive um, with a chairman who is the who was the entrepreneur, who was the who had the ideas and so on. So, um, so yeah. So then, you know, now I know that you did have to do some, as you mentioned, pretty complicated financial transactions and fundraising and, and other things, um, you know, with your with your Trinity hat on. But of course, as you said, now you made the transition to being, um, you know, the person running your own business and you had to do the same thing. And of course, big capital intensive industry um, like the energy industry. So you would have had to go do the rounds. And I know you did the rounds in, you know, in multiple places and multiple countries. So, so let's dive into that. Cause that's, that's something that, you know, not every leader or entrepreneur gets exposed to in the way that you're accustomed to it in, you know, North America and other parts of the world, venture capital and other, and other types of fundraising. So can you talk a little bit about that, that, that journey that you went on, um, you know, that ultimately led you to find an investor? Okay. Um, well, that part did start with Trinity. So whilst um, I was a CEO, not necessarily an entrepreneur, we had a lot of fundraisers. So I learned a lot about the capital markets or the international capital markets then. Um, and it prepped me for what we did at De Novo to a large extent. So I'll, I'll tap it from two perspectives. One I'll say is the soft, the soft side and then the hard technical side. So the easier one is the hard technical side. Um, and that is you've got to understand your numbers at the end of the day. So whether it be private equity, whether it be a bank, whoever it is, you've got to be really thorough with your numbers, understand your numbers, be realistic about it. Many times I've seen folks who have come to discuss business proposals with me and the numbers just do not make sense, right? Um, and, you know, you could pick poke more holes into it. So it sounds very easy. But it's a very difficult task to get right, to understand your numbers, get it right, and make sure that you're not trying to fool anyone, um, that it's realistic, it makes sense, it's logical, it's, um, you run your sensitivities, your scenarios, etc. That is critical um, because you could come with the best sales pitch, all these things, and once they start going to the numbers, if it fails, then you'll get nowhere. Um, so that really is a strong point. That also allows you or tells the investor or prospective investor, whether that's an equity investor or a debt investor vis-a-vis -a, -vis a bank or another type institution, that you, ha you have a good handle of managing money. Because um, if you can't get your numbers right, you know, why are they going to give you, whether it be 10,000, 100,000 or 10 million to manage on their behalf, uh, to manage it properly so that they can get their money out with a return. Um, so that confidence has to flow through um, in the hard uh, from a hard perspective in regards to the numbers um, and, and don't don't uh, how best to put it uh, don't play around with that be very be very sure on that on the soft side um, a lot of entrepreneurs actually had a meeting yesterday with one presenting brilliant idea but it, it's, it's so brilliant that to explain it to the lay person is very difficult in a lot of cases it's, it, it could be it could be technical um, I'll give you an example of a coffee shop I don't own a coffee shop. 
I only like cappuccinos. I don't understand how it works. But if you're pitching a coffee shop idea to an investor, you need to pitch it in a way that that person will understand, uh, assuming that that person doesn't really understand coffee, right? Um, um, and that, is, that, that soft skill is equally important to get them excited within the first three to five minutes so that they will then move forward with the numbers and so on. So being able to explain your vision, what you are seeing and the opportunity very clearly is critical in those first couple of minutes. Um, that's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's critical. If you can't, then the person or the likelihood is the person will lose interest very quickly. Um, and how you do that, it's, I would suggest, and what we have done before, is you do a lot of trial runs. You know, the example is, you know, go by a grandmother. And if your grandmother can understand it to a grandfather, someone who does not understand your business, um, but who you trust, you know, pitch it to them so that they can understand, you know, and do those barometers and tweak it. Um, those are quick wins or quick things you can do um, to really fine tune your pitch, as we call it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's powerful. So when you went on your journey, um, so I know ultimately you you secured funding from a Swiss company. I'm gonna come back to that one. But so did you did you did you do pitching um, to a significant level in in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean as well? My 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 Chiki, my my dream for the energy sector is um, how best to explain this nicely. A lot of the wealth created from our resources, right, um, is owned by foreigners, mm -hmm. right? And what Trinity started along this journey was to have greater, what do you call, local content at the ownership level, um, not just in, 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 in services being provided to, to the companies. So that's a vision I always have, to have greater local ownership at the, at the equity level. So, yes, I did approach many local investors, right? Um, and, and we're still down. So they were like, no, um, whew, that will never happen. Um, some have come back and want to invest now, but that's a different story. And in one of the articles that I, that, that, that I was interviewed on, the one thing that hurts me a lot is that Trinidadians in particular don't support other Trinidadians, right? Um, you know, it's almost as if they, I wouldn't say want you to fail. It's like, hmm, yeah, you go forward, boy, you know, if you make it, I'll be a friend. If not, you know, I knew that boy will fail, or I knew that girl will fail. I don't know if that's cultural. I, I think it is. But anyone who steps out of the box, you know, it's 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 they, they look at you very careful. And when you succeed, then they then they cling on to you. If you don't, they'll be like, Yep, I always knew that that business idea was flawed and so on. And and that needs to change in our culture and our psyche. You know, we need to support each other. Um, whether the person feels or not, whether you think they feel or not, um, there, there are two classic examples for me. Classic, classic. Um, and I, I felt into that trap, you know, 15, 20 years ago. I was I was part of that. Uh, I was living in England, and my younger brother called me and said, hey, Monty, they're setting up this thing called Movie Town. I said, oh, okay, cool. You know, tell me about it. He said, yeah. And it's $45 for one movie. I said, bust, that failed. That will never work. Right? You know, when I left, we were paying $12 for two movies at Globe. Right? Um, you know, who's going to pay $45 for a movie? I was proven wrong, right? It is great. It is a monumental success. And it's not just a movie theater. Um, I didn't have the mindset back then to open my mind up to understand what exactly was that person's vision. All right. Um, the second one is actually my best friend. Um, and he's the owner of Hacker. Um, and we've been best friends for about 20 years. And... When he came up with the idea, um, he, was a, he was an investment bank in London working for JP Morgan, and he quit, came back home, and then he set up Hacker. And I'm like, um, and he's, it was established in 2009, right after the crash, 2008. I'm like, dude, <laughs> um, we, we both know what's going on globally. You know, what are you doing? You know, he's like, no, I believe in this. Um, he studied in Canada, and he remembered the food from Canada, and et cetera, and monumental success. You know, 12 restaurants later, you know, um, a very big brand, um, well known and, and doing quite well. So, um, you know, I, I did support him, but I always had that niggling feeling of, mm, you know, he's going to go back to banking. You know, it wasn't like, you know, you're going to be a monumental success, you know. So, you know, and, and it just taught me that, that, you know, we have to change our thinking when ideas come to us that, you know, 
how do I help that person succeed, right? Um, versus may I go out on your own? You, you said something there that actually I want to, to, to touch on because, you know, it's funny, like with, you know, either parts of, um, you know, my team um, on the Caribbean Idea side where we, you know, can have dedicated, um, you know, personnel on the business development side or with, uh, you know, other friends who are doing things. And I was kind of coined um, this phrase called vision selling. Um, and, you know, vision selling is hard at the best of times when you are trying to convince someone. And fr- frankly, you had to do that um, to, to to raise funds for DeNovo. And I always say, like, you know, in my experience, you know, starting off before we be- became um, Criminal Ideas, the digital agency, we wanted to go build, you know, a web portal. And, and what we experienced with sort of telling somebody about a thing that you want to do when it doesn't exist is that, you know, in my experience in the Caribbean, um, you can do it. You can get support to your point, um, you know, usually from friends and family, if anything else, and and maybe a little bit beyond that. But for the most part, people want to see it. And when it's real, um, then people will attach to it. And that has pretty important implications for, you know, Caribbean entrepreneurs. And I'm not saying that, you know, you can never go raise money, but but one of the things that that it seems to connect to for me is the idea that in some cases, it's not always possible, um, as you would know, but in some cases, if you can go and and build that minimum viable product or build that MVP or do, you know, do something and show something and show and prove, you are you are far more able to raise and attach interest and, and connection to it after the fact um, than when you do it up front. And, and I think what you described about your experience sort of certainly certainly maps to that. So then if we switch tax, um, at the same time you were ultimately able to go do, you know, your your fundraising tour. And I don't think it's not like you, you only got knows in, in Trinidad, you got knows on other places as well, but you ultimately found, you know, uh, a big company to invest. What were some of the reasons that you think, um, you know, your pitch worked at that time? Was it because you'd had more reps and you'd gotten it sharper? Was it, you know, an understanding of what you were trying to do? T- t- tell me why you think that that worked where others might not have. It worked. Uh, actually, it worked because we, adjusted our pitch based on the audience. So the original pitch was, you know, we were pitching to investors to invest in an upstream oil and gas company in Trinidad to develop a field. And that was the standard pitch we were accustomed to, right? Um, that was accustomed to. And then I analyzed the market deeper and said, well, maybe there are investors out there or there's an investor out there that will look at this very differently because they have a, because the, the need is different. And that's when the, the investor the, 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 the investor we got, Proman, um, they liked our pitch because we actually changed the entire pitch because they, uh, they, they own uh, a majority of the methanol plants in Trinidad and Tobago, and they were short on natural gas um, for other reasons. So they needed natural gas into their facility, but they were not involved in the upstream. So we actually changed the, the pitch and also changed how the numbers were presented. So, for example, for them, it was more about what's the cost of the gas to them, right? Not necessarily the overall return to the investor, right? So that little pitch, and we kind of had, we had some insight as to what gas prices were in the U.S. and so on. So when we did the pitch and our proposition was, you know, a low, low-cost gas solution, it was like, wow, okay, this is what we want. And that, that got them on the hook very early. And then it, it sort of built from there and the due diligence was, was pretty, uh, was done fairly quickly. So the lesson we learned there is to be flexible again and to sometimes unlearn and tweak what you learned. Because if you had went with the traditional approach we did, you know, that your typical, that we, that we normally do, we may not have gotten that one. Um, but by tweaking it, we got, we, we hit on the, that person's, how best to put it, um, their psyche, what was important for them. And sometimes it's not all about just returns and so on. There are other things that could drive investor decisions. So, you know, doing the due diligence on the potential investor was equally important to really understand what will drive that person or make that person invest in you. When we come back, Monty talks about managing through the macro shock of COVID-19, how he thinks long-term about business evolution, and how he manages the stress of leadership in environments that you don't always control. We 
we're having this conversation in the midst of, um, you know, uh, COVID-19. And I'm curious how, um, you know, how this shock has, in, has, has affected you. You talked a little bit about, you know, some of the predictions early on. Um, you know, I think people would have to be be, be be living under a little bit of a rock to not see, um, you know, oil prices, you know, going going down, um, going negative for, for a little bit, you know, a, a week or two ago in, in uh, late April. So so what are some of the impacts that you've had directly as a result of, of this shock? So from my perspective, I think more longer term. So the, to the immediate business, without giving out too much of our company's thing, we, we're in a good position because we sell at a fixed price. Right, um, so our revenue was not necessarily impacted significant. Wasn't impacted um, thus far, uh, but our one of our major pillars within the business is always to be low cost, um, so that if anything happens, we could also drop prices to the lowest possible level below our competitors, so that you know try to be the last man standing. Um, so that's one of the key things for us. Um, so in that regard, you know we're fine, but you know oil and gas companies need to grow. So the issue is. With decarbonization, um, uh, because of climate change, you know, we the world as we're seeing, you know, will not probably be want to use oil um, um, for the foreseeable future um, than gas, all right? And how does renewables play into it? You know, so if you're in upstream, you know, in 30, 40, and 20 years time, are we still relevant? Um, 20 years time seems like ages ago, but. Um, as you said, in a big gestation period for an upstream company is pretty long. So you've got to start thinking, you know, pretty early as to how do you, how do you, how does your business evolve? So that's what is, that's what, that is what is at the forefront of my mind. And I think it's applicable to all businesses, not just energy. So sometimes you have your traditional businesses in the Caribbean versus what, what trying to predict what future trends will be and to be, a, to be ahead of that game so that you have, you have your first move advantage. Um, will be critical because every business is, is being challenged right now as we speak. You know, no business, very few businesses uh, untouched, barring maybe pharmaceuticals and, and other things and food. How do you change that game, right? Um, how do you change food production in Trinidad? You know, I'd love to see farm to, farm to, uh, farm to table, you know, um, where you eliminate the middlemen. I mean, that's a dangerous conversation, but could you create an Amazon of the vegetable market in Trinidad and Tobago? <laughs> where you go online, buy vegetables, and it's delivered to your door, right? Um, so there, there are many things. I mean, and those are, that's just an uh, off-the-cuff idea. There are many things that, you know, will happen, and it depends on where you sit. And I think investors are looking, actively looking for new ideas like that because there are a lot of folks who are still liquid, um, who have the cash, and who are looking for whom. I mean, yeah, from uh, uh, within the Caribbean as well. And within... Yeah, individuals and institutions. Of course, of course, and it's funny that you mention agriculture because um, I, I will, I will send you, and I will be a good company man and use the opportunity to cross promote that uh, one of our podcasts was was actually about was with a so- social entrepreneur named Alpha Senon who's doing some some fascinating things in agriculture. Um, but I want to kind of come back to you know because you said something there that was super interesting and um, and you also said it in a different way earlier on, which was that, hey, you know, one of the one of the factors in your Trinity experience was not being able to predict the macro environment. And then here we are with, you know, a, a health pandemic that no one was able to predict. And and the the common thread in there is that, you know, to a certain extent, we as leaders and entrepreneurs can put some pressure on ourselves to to try to think more deeply and 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 think more expansively and anticipate. But then to another extent, the very nature of macroeconomic shocks, whether it's a global financial crisis in 2008 and 9 or, you know, or, or a pandemic today or whatever, is that they are hard to predict. So that um, a part of the of the skill, if you will, is maybe not necessarily purely in the prediction, uh, which is really hard, but in the adaptation and the reaction. So you operate in an environment that is very um, uh, prone or subject to larger, you know, shocks or larger things that you can't predict. You don't know when there's going to be a, you know, an OPEC issue or, a, you know, 
to two folks arguing about uh, about you know increasing production or reducing production is going to have an impact on prices. Um, so how do you manage the stress of you know operating in an environment that 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 works like that? First, I, I started yoga, <laughs> but um, um, one of the things is is when you in setting up the business, it a big part of it is choosing the right stakeholders and partners. And what I mean by that, you know, your your stakeholders have to, I won't say be like mind like minded, but again, align to that common objective. So through the bad times, they could also help you, right? Um, and and if not, you know, then it makes the problems a lot harder. So for small businesses, I'm, I'm aware, for example, if you rent somewhere in wherever, whatever part of the world with COVID, if your landlord is not supportive of what you're doing, all right, and they demand the rent, that could kill your business, right? Irrespective of how much liquidity you have, you know, how long it lasts, it could be a big issue. Um, and that's a small example I'm using. Um, if your shareholders or the investors in Nova and so on, you know, are not supportive, then, you know, you have a big issue. Um, so bringing alignment with all your stakeholders is, 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 is very important, however small or however big you are, so, it, so that you manage the external stresses together. Right, um, and I don't mean to sound like you know sing kumbaya, but you know the more you have that, and the greater alignment you have, the easier it is to manage these macro stresses. Um, so, case in point, in COVID, if you're and I've had friends whose landlords have said, "Listen, we understand you're making zero revenue. All right, just pay the just pay the the, the, the electricity bill, for example, suspend the rent." Right? I have other friends who no nope, landlords are pay full rent, and you know they may go out of business. Um, yep. The banks have given more, you know. So all of that is 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 very important um, because there's something governments can do to help, but governments, you know, it can be difficult to mandate a landlord to, you know, not help you. So, so those are that. That's 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 how we try. That's how we manage it, um, and through our entire supply chain too as well. So even for us, you know, we reached out to our, all our suppliers. What do you need help with? You know, do we pay you? Do, should we pay you in advance? Should we pay you sooner? Um, you know, so we do that for our folks. It's, it's living, it's, it's living it as well. So you have a role to, to help, and almost, you know, you will be helped as well. Um, and building that entire network is important. Yeah, that's that's powerful, and and you know, it's interesting because I always like to kind of touch on 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 all sides, right? And I know that you know, like me, you have um, you know a couple of young children, but here you are doing entrepreneurial stuff. So as you mentioned, yoga. Um, you know, and 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 we talk a little bit about the balance thing, right? Because the balance thing is real. You know, you, it, it, it is a it is a real factor. And I always remember reading um, a Tim Ferriss book, Tools of Titans, which is a big, huge book. It's a real tome of a of a book, and I haven't even finished it yet. But but there are lots of things where he kind of compiled things that he took from different people that he had talked to on his own podcast and his interviews and different things, his book preparation. Um, and yeah, and I, I, and it, it got me that plus some other friends got me thinking about, thinking, oh, okay, yeah, maybe we need to start dabbling with a little meditation, seeing again, too many gray hairs, etc. So how do you find, you talked about yoga. What are some other things that you have learned to try to get balance between life <laughs> and family, and business. Very good point. And I mean, I'll share something with the audience. Um, you know, when I was 19, I was diagnosed with uh, a medical condition, um, not life-threatening and so on. Um, and, you know, you got scared, did the test, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it taught me to look at life differently. So 25 years later, um, you know, my the same doctor who's, who's been seeing me for a year, for a year on year, and I said, you know, um, whatever you're doing, you're doing it well because it's not deteriorating. It's flat line, which is good, right? Um, right. And it, it forced me, and sorry, I also befriended, um, when I say befriended, one of our interns back in, um, in Trinity when I was about 30, um, during one of her other internships, she used to take care of, um, of what do you call it, um, patients who are about to die. And, you know, she said, terminal patients live a more fulfilling life than people who don't know when they're going to die, right? Um, because they value their time differently. They know in six months, you know, lives will be out. So the next six months, every minute makes a difference. Hmm. And in talking to her, I realized, wow, that's a very, uh, that's about 15 years ago. I realized that's very true, you know, because we just assume when you're young, we're, immort you know, we're immortal, we're, we're going to live forever. We're Superman, Superwoman. 
not realizing that, you know, life is very precious and the only thing we really have is time. Um, so in looking at that, I said, well, you know, how am I going to extend time? So I put a KPI on my life. I said, I, I want to live past 90, right? Uh, what am I going to do to achieve that? I have to be healthy. So I really believe in healthy eating, um, eating no processed foods and, you know, heavy into nutrition. Um, uh, I try to exercise a lot. Um, you know, should I do more? Yes, like everyone else. Um, I try to sleep, you know, seven hours a night, which I do. Um, so I put my kids to sleep. You know, we all go to sleep at seven, seven thirty. Once I have no business dinners or whatever the case is, and um, and you realize you get into that routine and that pattern, which then brings alignment with everything else. So you're sharper. So I'm up at you know five o'clock in the morning doing yoga um, and exercising till you know half past six, seven. Yeah. Um, and that that routine has built a very helped me to balance things and and calm. And realize that in life, you know, you tend to worry a lot. And you ask yourself, well, what are you worrying about? Well, you worry about things, you know, that the things that you worry about, most cases, you have no control over, you know. Um, people worry about politics and this and that and what's happening. And like, well, the only thing you have control over is your reaction, right? How are you acting? How you control your emotions? How you control yourself? And if you focus on what you have control over, which, you, which I've realized is me, and what you know, my mind. Then things start. To, the world looks a lot different. Looks you look at the world differently, right? Um, and then you then see how could I influence others to create positive change. And my view is you influence others for positive change through your own actions. Um, and 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 that's how you know I've evolved um, and continue to evolve. Um, so I'm the chairman of the Heroes Foundation. You know, that gives me great joy. You know, that's about mentoring kids. We have a Big Brother, Big Sister program. We are affiliated with the Global Big Brother, Big Sister. We have a youth development program. We have comics. Um, you know, we're looking at a media arm, you know, and and, and, and some really heartwarming stories of, of, you know, what the social workers, we have 10 social workers with us working full time, you know, and, and what they do. And to me, that's, yeah, that gives me great fulfillment, more so than the Novo and entrepreneurs is, you know, if I could really help change uh, the minds of people, you know, I think um, that would be great, you know, because in the end, that's what will matter the most. Wow. I mean, yeah. And you know, it's funny. I, every time I do one of these, I, you know, I always learn many interesting things and, and, and I'm inspired in, in multiple ways. And I have to say that that, you know, that that was, that was, that was pretty uh, amazing stuff that you said there because it, it really kind of, you know, hit me in a, in a number of ways, having been at, you know, the entrepreneurial side for, you know, 13 plus years. And, and you're right. I mean, everything that you said is, is so bang on. So I think for, for folks listening, it's, it's really important to find those, those, those things that, that give you joy, I think is one of the things that I take away from what you said. It's also important to find ways that work for you to, to, um, you know, to create balance because, um, you know, your, your mind and your mental space is so important. Uh, and actually, maybe that's a good, um, a good sort of jumping point to, to something else, right? Um, I wanted to explore with you something that I think is you know, important to, to talk about, which is, you, you know, earlier on, we explored this idea of, you know, helping each other and, you know, taking ideas to other people and jumping in and supporting. And, and one of the things that has been really intriguing to me as I talk to, to different innovators and leaders on this show is that there's a central trait or common trait that I see across everybody, which is optimism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because, you know, even in my own entrepreneurial life, um, I am around within my own organization, frankly, if I'm very real, um, you know, some people who are positive and upbeat and connected to the mission. And there's some people who complain about everything. And, you know, they're, they're, they, even though we try to have a value that's solution focused and positive, there's like, there's nothing that the organization can ever do that is good enough. Um, and, and then I talk to entrepreneurs and they're all positive and they're all optimistic. And so what are some of the traits that you've found are really common to, to leaders who are doing and pushing the envelope and taking things further? Are there any, any other things that have stood out to you? Yeah, one is actually humility. Um, the, the other one is understanding 
understanding people, right? Um, and I guess that's a link to humility to, to a large extent, but really understanding people and listening to people, right? Not just your staff, but everyone, um, your staff, your investors, your stakeholders, you know, um, you've seen globally in a lot of cases or locally or personal experiences where people just don't listen, right? Um, the more you listen, interpret, you don't have to do what the other people say, but, you know, someone may talk 10, you know, for 10 minutes, but that last two to seconds could change your life, right? Um, so the ability to listen, truly listen, is, it, it differentiates people in a big way. Um, um, uh, so humility, ability to listen. And yeah, that, that sense of optimism is equally important and confidence. Um, and not to confuse confidence with arrogance, but that confidence flows through, right? Um, and, and as we spoke about earlier, investor pitches, you know, nobody wants to invest in someone who's not confident because the one thing investors know is it will not, it will not be a bed of roses. They need someone who's going to say, hey, uh, whatever problem you, uh, that you will encounter, that individual is going to overcome it, right? And has the confidence to do it. Because if not, if everything is a problem, then it just will not work. Because you will have problems. You will have challenges. Um, you know, and the Denovo story, I mean, and there's a classic case where, I mean, it's a bit of a joke that we share. Um, we had a massive issue, right, in the middle of in 2017, yeah. in the middle of our drilling campaign, where, long story short, uh, whenever you drill, um, you take the risk of not necessarily finding oil and oil or gas, right? And we drilled and we're drilling and we were not finding the gas, the, 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 the gas reservoir, right? So you can imagine, you know, we raised all this money. Um, we had reasonable confidence and from all the work we've done that the gas was there and the, all of the data coming out while we're drilling says the gas is not there, right? So, right, and that's very transparent while we're drilling, right? So quickly the organization knew uh, uh, we, we missed the well, you know, we missed the reservoir. <laughs> right? Um, it's like game over, literally, you know, because, um, and, you know, you walked into, I walked into the office and I looked at everyone's face, like, you could just see doom and gloom, right? Just got a team together, said, you know, let's analyze this, what's wrong, what's happening, et cetera, et cetera. Got everyone on the table and long story short is, is we, we got the target wrong, essentially. We were off like about five meters. So we had to do a sidetrack and we came back and found the reservoir. Um, cost a little bit more money, but, you know, we found it. But, you know, I was optimistic and says, you know, we will find a solution and we'll find it, right? Because if I went in there stating game over, you know, it, it'll be the end, right? Um, so, and, and, and you, you've got to have that attitude. And as one of my mentors said, it's like a duck in water, right? You look at the duck and the duck is like looking around, but below the water, right? The feet are moving, you know, a mile a minute. <laughs> Right, so yeah, but you gotta you gotta be calm and 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 think about how we can overcome this, and and that requires a lot of self confidence. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize confidence, not arrogance, um, to really see it through. And investors and stakeholders want to see that inner confidence with humility, um, because that they'll feel safe that you will you'll do what it takes, right, to make it a success. Absolutely, not blame anyone. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, as we kind of wrap, um, I think that, that there have been some some really, you know, fascinating themes throughout the conversation. But I think I want to kind of close on, or get, a little, or get a little introspective at the end, I suppose. Um, I want to kind of close on, on, on a couple of pieces that I thought are important. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier on the importance and as you look back of of some of the formal or informal mentors. Um, but you also talked about in this conversation and in others um, about the importance of creating, uh, you know, a new, a new type of leader. And I'm going to um, play back for you. One of the things that, you, you know, I, I saw you talk about in, in another interview, you said that you, you need to create leaders who can think big, articulate a vision and be flexible, agile, and collaborative. And, and so within a kind of Trinidadian um, and larger Caribbean and maybe even larger diaspora context, why is that important to you to see us create? Um, and, and why are those things 
so important from your standpoint? Because if, if we if we could do it as a Caribbean or country by country than a Caribbean, you have greater control over it, over the destiny of yourself, your communities, and your country. Bottom line, yeah. And if you if you, if you think small, like I'm, I'm only going to have a successful one coffee shop, then you know what are you doing? Great. Why can't you replicate it? Why can't you be the Starbucks of the Caribbean? Why can't you know what's stopping you? Yeah, um, from creating employment, from you know building sustainable wealth for generations and it doesn't have to be for you or for your kids it could be for your other shareholders for whatever the case is um why not yeah you know why not and that, that's all i said why not why why think small right uh not saying start big but don't limit yourself don't limit the abilities you know um and that's why uh, the american dream is the american dream you know everyone you know you see it you know uh, amazon started off in a small garage, etc. You know, he didn't think of just selling books. If he had stopped at books, then Amazon will not be where it is now, right? And it's not about Jeff Bezos making money for himself. You know, uh, he created an organization that's created employment that's done a lot of things. I mean, people could question his practices and so on. Um, this conversation is not about that, but it's about why not? You know, and then if you could chart how you manage your own stakeholders, um, then so be it. Yeah. Go for it. Absolutely. And and maybe that's a a, a good uh, place for for me to ask you about you know when you look forward you know three four five years and you don't have a perfect crystal ball as we've kind of touched on earlier on but but when we talk about vision and and you know uh, and and asking yourself why not where do you think De Novo could be or should be or where would you like it to be um, you know when you think 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 further out. Um, you know, I, I wanted to grow and I would like to see the model replicated, right? Um, so whilst we're upstream, there's a, there's, there's, we could replicate the model, you know, and, and if we could share the learnings with other people, that's great. Um, because, you know, in sharing, we learn and in sharing, hopefully we allow other businesses to become even more efficient as well. Um, and a rising tide lifts, lifts all boats. So that's one thing that, you know, um, we, our team is going to be focusing on. Um, so there'll be a lot more news clips, not from me, but from my team members and, and their subject matter areas. Um, from a broader perspective, I'll answer the two areas that I'll answer from. One, the de novo opportunity in, in upstream, I see, I'm very optimistic as majors in Trinidad and Tobago, BP, Shell, and BHP relook their portfolio, there's opportunity for us to grow and, and partner with them to help them with their business models. So Trinidad is still a big oil and gas province, so I see opportunity there. But in the long term, you know, with um, with a move to renewable energy, you know, we're going to have to move to renewable energy at some point in time as well, right? So how that makes changes over time, question mark, and that's something that's on uh, on my mind. But more importantly, for everybody outside the oil and gas, which is probably 99%, 99.9% of the population, um, I see great opportunity because certainly within Trinidad and Tobago, you've got to diversify or build all of the other areas of the economy. And hopefully, you know, the government and the business folk in this country really understand that now more so than ever. And you should see a push in developing other businesses. And if you focus on a technology-anchored business, new ideas, I think, you know, you have a lot of people searching for these type of ideas with capital, um, and I think it's it's a, a ripe playground for young entrepreneurs to start up. Um, be a difficult road, but I think it's it's, it's quite ripe, you know, in, in whatever area. Um, so that's that's where I see a huge positive on the other side. Um, and big organizations tend to take a bit long to move, right? Um, the smaller, more nimble you are, you could actually have that agility on your side. Um, and with technology, you know, you could you could really scale up quickly. Um, depending on what what you're doing, yeah, yeah, and it's and it's interesting that you that you talk about you know the fork in the road that 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 every business has to um, consider, which is you know how is it going to play in a world with a backdrop of climate change and renewables and so on, and of course in your world <laughs> that's even that's even more important. How are you sort of seeing the renewables um, side of, of of things as it pertains to your 
business and and its carbon footprint or the what, what aspects are, are, yeah. are you kind of focus on there but well, i think the uh, i read the shell global ceo statement three days ago and he pretty much said you know shell will be zero carbon he had a kpi of being zero, uh, zero carbon for shell by 2050 and now he's stating you know that's a bit late it has to be sooner so if these big multinationals are moving to zero carbon, which is not producing oil and gas, right, um, and being fully renewable within the next 30 years, um, that tells you where their thinking is. And some of the changes you're seeing globally, you know, Saudi Aramco had an IPO, you know, so they essentially are divesting uh, part of their portfolio, cashing out, as we see it, and starting to diversify the economy because they realize that, you know, in 30, 40 years' time, you know, there is the possibility no one might be using oil, right? Uh, um, gas might still be there as a bridging fuel. Um, so all these things are evolving very quickly, um, and certainly the trend is there. And once you have more entrepreneurs and more capital behind it, it could accelerate that. Now, I, st- I still think you need fuel. I mean, sorry, when I say fuel, I mean gasoline and oil and so on, but the demand will be a lot less. Um, so I, I, I see that transition happening more so than ever. And the benefits are very clear, you know, less pollution and the impact of pollution is, is significant. Um, no one could deny that. And people don't understand the impact on your health um, just by breathing, by their respiratory problems, all these things. It's, it's, it very much impacts us individually. Um, and I, was, I, I expect to see a major change in that shift or a big shift in that, um, that industry, in my industry. Great. Great. So, opportunities. Yeah. No, that's 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 absolutely true and absolutely powerful. So it's a kind of recap, you know. So you've gone from, you know, a career in Ernst and Young, which uh, we, so so for, I guess we have to give some shout outs because we we're both, um, uh, you know, alums of St Mary's College, and and I also spent a couple of years, um, even though I'm more on the marketing track. Yeah. Uh, I was getting a kick out of the fact that I spent two years at an accounting company to start starting my career in marketing and overlapped with you very briefly there. And you went from that to, you know, uh, focus on the energy sector to, um, you know, experience abroad in the UK to then, um, you know, getting uh, after a small side journey back in banking in Trinidad to, to getting tapped and kind of going into that executive leadership role uh, and now doing your own thing. And across that, you know, pretty fascinating journey. Um, and I think one of the things that, that, that you said earlier on that also stands out and is maybe a kind of the closing question is about, you know, you, you learned about managing and, and, and taking calculated risks. You ironically jumped into your business um, at a, and went out to raise money at a time when, um, you know, it would seem kind of counterintuitive. And here again, we are at a, at a time that it sort of seems doom and gloom and, you know, uh, there's lots of bad things happening and, um, and, and lots of challenges and pain. But I think I'm always, you know, I guess influenced by the, the stories of the companies that that went against the grain at the time when it seemed, um, you know, when it when it seemed like it was the worst. Um, so so maybe a, a parting thought from you that I'd be interested in would be, you know, this idea of of taking risk when uh, it seems like it's the worst time to do it. Um, maybe you could just share closing thoughts around um, around that and, and what the opportunity could be for companies or people who try to do that. Sure. What I would say is the folks that have become extremely wealthy, the time they, 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 they invest when the markets are down, <laughs> that is when they invest. So full stop. That's, that's, this is the time to invest, get investors in because everyone knows, you know, I won't say buy low and sell high, but the market is down. People are looking for opportunities. People have cash. This is when investments are the good investments people are looking to invest in, um, quite frankly. So um, I am, again, remain positive in that regard. Yeah, People will look for value deals. People will look for that niche opportunity. Um, um, and once you can explain the vision to them as it fits into the new world, um, I think you will have, you'll, you'll, you'll have some open ears. That was Monty Pemberton founder of Denovo Energy 
an independent upstream energy company in Trinidad and Tobago that's continuously challenging the status quo by always asking the question why. If you'd like to be the first to know when the next episode of Uptick drops, please subscribe to this podcast via your preferred platform and don't forget, share it with a friend. On behalf of Caribbean Ideas Synapse, this is Chike Farrell signing off. And remember, keep on ticking up.